This program provides an introduction to the Bodine inline assembly and test machine. A second, more detailed program outlines maintenance procedures for the drive, tooling belt, and tooling units. The Bodine modular inline assembly and test carousel style machine is designed for high speed continuous production. It is an extremely rigid machine with a highly accurate station to station index. Its reliable, mechanically actuated synchronous format is the foundation of hundreds of Bodine high speed assembly systems in dozens of industries. Machine cycle times in typical applications range from 35 to 55 strokes per minute but can be as high as 70 strokes per minute. Here you see the basic chassis without part feeders or tooling. The machine is symmetrical above and below the center line. The belt that carries the part pallets from station to station is centered on the machine's center line. The upper and lower castings are identical. So the tooling plates, the upper and lower camshafts, and the upper and lower pivot shafts are located at equal distance above and below the center line. This allows every Bodine carousel to accommodate standard tooling. Each set of castings is called a bay. The machine can have as few as two or as many as eight bays. Pallets are used to carry the fixtures that hold the in-process assemblies. The pallets are mounted to a continuous tensioned steel belt that indexes them from station to station. Pallets are typically spaced at 8-inch intervals. Some machines utilize 4-inch intervals. At the end of the machine, there is a fixed, powered drive wheel that indexes the belt. An idler wheel at the other end of the machine adjusts in and out to allow proper tensioning and is not involved with index accuracy once it is properly set up. The indexing drive wheel has 16 index pins in its circumference which engage accurately pierced holes in the belt. The full diameter of the beveled index pins should project from the wheel 25 thousandths, which is the thickness of the belt. On the underside of the wheel, there are precision shot pin bushings that are engaged by a cam-controlled lock pin. The pin secures the pallets after each index and prevents the tooling forces from being transmitted back to the drivetrain. The tip of the pin should clear the bushing by 1 8 inch at the bottom of the stroke. The cams at each station provide the mechanical actuation of the tooling. Basic tooling modules include pick and place transfer units, press units, inspection units, and other processes based on your application, such as adhesive application, welding, and light fabrication. To control and monitor your Bodine system, there are a number of standard and optional operator interface features. When the machine is stopped or being jogged, the encoder display shows you the encoder degrees within the 360 degree cycle. During automatic operation, it shows the speed of the machine. Your machine may also include a pendant control station with touchscreen control and a message display that gives you diagnostic information for troubleshooting including both safety and inspection faults. Monitors for specific operations can also be located near the appropriate station. Note the placement of the emergency stop button on your control panel. Pushing the emergency stop button will immediately shut down all pneumatic and electrical power. In contrast, the cycle stop button stops the machine at the end of a normal cycle. The drive stop will stop the machine immediately but unlike the emergency stop, pneumatics and electrics remain on. It's important to note the location of the main electrical disconnect on the electrical and control enclosure. The enclosure also houses the programmable logic controllers or PLCs, contactors for motor control, the terminal blocks, and circuit breakers. This equipment controls the drive motor, solenoid valves, and the inputs to monitor the assembly process. While the machine is cycling in auto mode, the operator is protected by a light curtain that spans the length of the machine. If the beam is broken, the machine will stop. You'll have to reset the light curtain while the light beam is cleared. All these lights have to be out. Besides the auto mode for automatic operation during production, there are two other useful modes. 
The setup mode lets you run the part feeders continuously for debugging purposes or to purge and empty them. The manual mode lets you jog the machine when you are checking tooling or part index operations, clearing a jam, or performing other maintenance functions. Before you start the machine, perform a walk-around inspection. Make sure the electrical disconnect and the air supply are turned on and that air pressure is sufficient. Check to ensure that all feeder bowls and magazines are filled to the proper levels with clean, dry parts. If the machine has not been run for several days, press the manual loop button. Jog the machine carefully through a cycle to verify that transfer and working stations are functioning properly. Also remember to keep the machine as clean as possible at all times. Remove oil accumulations and any debris that may affect performance. Refer to your operator's manual for additional information as required before beginning operation. A machine jam or other abnormal situation can cause the overload protection unit to be tripped, stopping the machine. Notice that the LED on the unit will be off if the unit has been tripped. First, before you do anything else, locate the source of the jam. A typical jam you might encounter is a part being dislodged from the fixture and jams between the tool support bracket and the fixture itself. We'll show you how to clear this jam and reset your overload protection unit. In order to be able to turn the motor and clear the jam and leave power on the machine, the brake relay module will have to be removed. In order to reset the overload protection, you want to turn the red hand wheel to make the indexer travel opposite its normal rotation until the overload protection snaps back into place. When resetting the overload protection unit, look at the camshaft position dial to verify that the machine is moving in the opposite direction of normal machine rotation. The proximity sensor LED verifies that the unit is reset and the index fault can be cleared. If the problem was caused by a part jam, check to make sure the jam is cleared and check all tooling to ensure there is no damage. After the overload protection unit is reset, replace the brake relay module, then slowly jog the machine through a full cycle to ensure that all jams have been cleared. A pallet fixture jam is less likely, but it's a possible cause of a tripped overload protection unit. To check for a fixture pallet jam, you can rock the fixture left and right and up and down about 4 thousandths each way. If you find no movement, you can remove the pallet track guards on each side of the fixture, check for loose parts or debris in the rail, preventing the fixture from moving. If parts are found, the rail can be removed and cleaned, the screws can be backed off, taken a while, and the guide pulled out. It can now be checked for debris, cleaned, and reinstalled. As part of routine maintenance, the oil level of the central lubrication system reservoir should be checked daily and filled as necessary. The reservoir is generally equipped with a sight glass. When the level appears low, 
replenish the reservoir with mobile Vactra No. 3 or equivalent. A low oil level can result in a machine shutdown or equipment failure. For a complete list of weekly maintenance inspections and activities for the Bodine inline assembly and test machine, refer to the operation and maintenance manual. The following is a review of a few of the key inspection items. It's important to check the tension on the silent chain drives. Go to section 3 of this video for details on checking and adjusting tension. Play should typically not exceed one half inch travel. Check that all compliant links to tooling stations, such as press units and pick and place units, are able to compensate. Proper adjustment of the links is critical to eliminating play. If your machine is equipped with limited lube tooling for pick and place, press and other operations, no adjustment to the bushings is required. If your machine is equipped with cast iron dovetail slides, they should be checked occasionally for excess play by removing the clevis pin and attempting to rock or wiggle the slide between the adjustable gibs. Adjust the gibs if necessary. See section four of this program for details. Also check that all spring-loaded inspection plungers are free to compensate through the maximum distance required under the worst conditions, based on the part size and its positioning within the fixture. Bodine inline assembly and test machines are correctly timed when they leave the Bodine plant. If readjustment is required, we recommend that you contact Bodine before you begin work. For review purposes, the correct procedures for establishing camshaft zero, index timing, and proper position of the drive drum are outlined in this section of the program. Re-establishing camshaft zero is the first step to resynchronizing the machine after replacement of drivetrain components or loss of synchronization for other reasons. All mechanical tooling stations are driven from cams, which are keyed to either the upper or lower camshaft. To keep all motions synchronized, the camshafts are connected together with a silent chain drive and adjusted so both keyways are at 12 o'clock at exactly the same time. To see if you need to re-establish camshaft zero, Jog the machine until the lower camshaft keyway is level, as verified by a level placed on the keyway. Now place the level on the upper camshaft keyway. If it is not level, the upper camshaft must be adjusted so that it is in sync with the lower camshaft. To synchronize the upper and lower camshafts, loosen the hex bolts on the drive adapter and then slightly re-tighten them. Loosen the jam nuts and adjust the vernier adjusting set screws until the upper camshaft keyway is level at zero degrees. With both adjusting screws firmly against the dowel pin, re-tighten the hex bolts and lock the jam nuts. Recheck both the upper and lower camshafts to ensure that they are at zero degrees. During the procedure to remove the silent timing drive chains, the camshafts should be locked in place using the camshaft clamping plates available from Bodine. This is the safest and most convenient way to get the job done because it prevents the camshafts from rolling. To remove the shorter silent timing chain which links the indexer to the lower camshaft, Jog the machine until the camshaft position dial reads zero degrees, so the master links of both chains are accessible. Now install the camshaft clamping plate. Lock the camshafts in place by tapping a camshaft key into the lower camshaft keyway at the idle end of the machine and installing the plate over the camshaft and a corresponding pivot shaft. Make sure it is securely keyed in place. Remove tension from the chain by loosening the jam nut on the lower chain tensioning unit and turning the tie nut counterclockwise. With the lower camshaft locked securely in place, locate the master link and remove the link pin to break the chain. Then remove the chain from the machine. To install and tension the silent timing chain which links the indexer to the lower camshaft, 
loosened the hex bolts in the drive adapter on both sides of the shaft and back off the adjusting set screws from the dowel pin. Install the silent timing chain and close the master link unless you are tensioning an existing chain. Tension the chain by hand, turning the lower tensioning unit tie nut until the chain can be slightly deflected with the pressure of a thumb. 3 8 inch travel is acceptable play. Do not over tighten the chain to avoid excess stress on the machine. Lock the tie nut in place. At this point, the dowel in the lower vernier should be approximately at the center of its adjustment range. If this is not the case, remove tension from the chain and shift it one sprocket tooth in the appropriate direction. With the chain properly tensioned, tighten the hex bolts in the drive adapter and lock the adjusting screws firmly against the dowel. Unless the chain which links the upper camshaft to the lower camshaft is to be replaced and or tensioned, remove the camshaft clamping plate from the lower idle end of the machine and make sure that the camshafts are synchronized with each other and with the indexer. To remove the silent timing chain which links the upper and lower camshafts, loosen the hex bolts in the drive adapter and back off the adjusting set screws slightly from the dowel pin. Install the second camshaft clamping plate on the upper camshaft so that both camshafts are locked securely at zero degrees. Remove tension from the chain by turning the hex nut in the upper tensioning unit counterclockwise. Locate the master link to break the chain and remove the chain. To install and tension the silent timing chain which links the upper and lower camshafts, make sure that the hex bolts in the drive adapter have been loosened and the adjusting set screws are backed off from the dowel pin. Install the silent timing chain and close the master link unless tensioning an existing chain. Tension the chain by carefully turning the upper tensioning unit hex nut clockwise until there is 3 8 inch to 1 half inch deflection at the midpoint of the chain span opposite the tensioning unit. Do not over tighten. Lock the hex nut in place. At this point, the dowel pin in the drive adapter should be approximately at the center of its adjustment range. If this is not the case, remove tension from the chain and shift it one sprocket tooth in the appropriate direction. With the chain properly tensioned, tighten the hex bolts in the drive adapter and lock the adjusting set screws firmly against the dowel. Finally, remove the camshaft clamping plates from the idle end of the machine and make sure that the camshafts are synchronized with the indexer. This is covered in the next segment. To synchronize the camshafts to the indexer, jog the machine until the camshaft position dial reads zero degrees. Mark or scribe a line on the guide at the edge of the pallet and make a mark four inches farther in the direction of the index. Jog the machine so that the pallet has moved four inches or one half of an eight inch index. The camshaft position dial should read 60 plus or minus two degrees. If the dial reading is acceptable, synchronize the encoder to the camshaft position. This is described later in this program. If the dial reading is not acceptable, adjust the set screws on the drive adapter until the camshaft position dial reads 60 degrees. Now you may need to synchronize the encoder with the camshaft position. Correct synchronization of the drive wheel to the indexer is important to maintain smooth, efficient operation of the machine. Normally, the index locking pin should engage the drive wheel bushings silently. If a banging is encountered, it is necessary to adjust the timing coupling ring in order to synchronize the drive wheel with the indexing unit. Run the machine or jog it one cycle at a time, carefully observing if the pallets and fixtures jump slightly forward or backward when the locking pin engages the drive wheel bushings. If the pallets and fixtures jump forward, the drive wheel lags the indexer. To correct this problem on a machine with clockwise index rotation, loosen the three socket head screws which fasten the timing coupling ring to the index timing plate and slightly re-tighten them. Loosen the jam nut which secures the right hand adjusting screw and slightly back off the screw from the dowel. 
loosen the left hand jam nut and advance the left hand adjusting screw until it locks the dowel firmly between the two adjusting screws. Retighten both jam nuts. Finally, make adjustments as necessary until the locking pin silently engages the drive wheel bushings. To synchronize the encoder with the camshaft position, jog the machine until it is in its work cycle, which is when the index locking pin is fully engaged in a drive wheel bushing. Mark or scribe a line on the guide at the edge of the pallet and make a mark four inches farther in the direction of the index. Jog the machine so that the pallet has moved four inches or one half of an eight inch index. The camshaft position dial should read 60 plus or minus two degrees. If the dial reading is not acceptable, it is necessary to re-establish camshaft zero before proceeding. Review the appropriate portions of the video if necessary. If the camshaft position dial reading is acceptable, compare it to the encoder display mounted on the main control panel. The two readings should be within two degrees of each other. If not, the encoder setting must be adjusted. To adjust the encoder setting, loosen the two set screws in the timing belt pulley that extends from the encoder box. Turn the adapter hub with a drill blank or equivalent until the encoder display agrees with the camshaft position dial and re-tighten the set screws in the pulley. Repeat the encoder synchronization procedure to ensure an accurate setting. The timing belt, which connects the timing belt pulley with the camshaft pulley, should be set so that it is neither slack nor taut. It should have zero tension. To adjust the encoder timing belt, you first have to access the inside of the cover. Remove the four screws, lift the plate off. Inside you'll find two 3 8 screws. You'll back these off. And one on the outside. Once those are loose, you'll slide the encoder box forward and bring it till you have zero tension. You don't want it tight, you don't want it loose, you just want the slack taken out of the unit. Once you're satisfied with the tightness, you go back inside, tighten the two screws on the inside, tighten the one screw on the outside. Tension feels good, you can put the cover back on. Compare the encoder display mounted on the main control panel with the camshaft position dial. They should be within two degrees of each other. Adjust them if necessary. All machines leave the plant with the drive drum and idle drum properly positioned and the belt installed. Proper fit between pallets and pallet guides has been established. If the belt should break in the field, the following procedures should be used for removal of the old belt and installation of the new one. Start by removing the work holding fixtures from the pallets and placing them on a clean surface. Remove the track guards by pulling them over the rubber grommets that fasten them to the belt. The grommets may break and consequently have to be replaced when installing the track guards onto the new belt. To remove the belt, you will need four to eight people to help support it. If the belt is not completely severed, identify the pallet that is stamped master on one edge and locate the notches in the pallet guide support bar on the inside of the machine. These are located in the first bay on the left hand side of the machine. Carefully jog the belt until the master pallet is lined up with the notches in the pallet guide support bars. Loosen the four screws in the upper and four screws in the lower flange bearings at the idle end of the machine. Back off the adjusting screws for the idle wheel and push the idle wheel toward the drive end to remove tension from the belt. Remove the screws which fasten the master pallet to the belt. Then disconnect and separate the ends of the belt. Obviously, this is not necessary if the belt is completely severed. After placing paper on the floor, slide the pallets and belt toward the idle end of the machine and remove them. This will require four to eight people. Place the pallets and belt on the paper with the pallets facing the floor. 
remove the pallets from the belt and place them on the paper to keep them as clean as possible. Next, transfer the pallets to the new belt. When placing the new belt on the paper, ensure that the side with the pierced hole burrs faces down so that the smooth side will face the drum when it is installed. Screws should only be tightened enough to snug the washer. Note that the smooth side of the nylon washer goes against the belt. Check to ensure that the index locking pin is fully engaged in a drive wheel bushing. Make sure the pallet guide channels are clean and lubricate them with a light machine oil. Also check the felt wipers and replace them if necessary. To install the drive belt assembly, you'll need your team to help support and feed the belt. Using at least four to eight people, pick up the drive belt assembly and turn it so that its edge is perpendicular to the floor. Be careful when handling it to avoid buckling of the belt. While feeding the assembly, hold it in the same horizontal plane as the pallet guides. Both ends of the belt can be fed into the idle end of the machine simultaneously if access is available. Continue feeding while making sure each pallet is fully engaged in the pallet guides until the end reaches the notches in the pallet guide support bars. Slide the master pallet into the pallet guide channel from the drive end of the machine ahead of the belt. Now feed the end of the belt around the drive wheel into the pallet guide channel until the two ends meet. Next, you need to overlap the belts. On a clockwise indexing machine, slide the end of the belt which was fed from the drive end between the master pallet and the end of the belt that was fed from the idle end. Line up the first set of dowel holes in each end and engage the master pallet dowels. Refer to the drawings in your manual to confirm the correct overlap for both clockwise and counterclockwise indexing machines. Before placing the fixtures on the pallet, the belt should be properly tensioned. Adjust the screws on the idler wheel housing unit until the pillow blocks just touch the solid stop. It's a good idea to use a one thousandth inch feeler gauge between the pillow block and the solid stop. Remember to adjust the screws on both the top and the bottom of the housing. The light duty press is the simplest of the Bodine standard tooling units and requires little or no adjustment or maintenance. Vertical motion of either the cast iron dovetail slide or an aluminum block limited lube slide is provided by the cam transmitted through a bell crank mounted on the upper pivot shaft. The bell crank is connected to a vertical link. There are three types, solid adjustable, spring loaded and air cylinder. The vertical link in turn is connected to the slide. The stroke is determined by the cam path. Maximum stroke is three and a half inches. Once set for the press operation, little or no adjustment is required. To adjust the vertical stroke of the unit, jog the machine until the station to be adjusted is at the extreme lowest point of its vertical stroke. Loosen the jam nuts at both ends of the vertical link. Turn the vertical link until the desired tooling height is reached and tighten the jam nuts. To adjust the dovetail slide and check it for play, first remove the clevis pin, grab the slide, see if it'll rock. If you have play in the slide, it needs adjustment. In this case here, the play is obvious. Adjustment is required. In order to adjust, loosen the three socket head cap screws and tighten the adjusting screws on the side to push the gib in against the slide removing the play. After the adjustment is finished three cap screws have to be retightened. We'll double check to see that there's no play in the slide and that the slide moves under its own weight. The rectangular pick and place unit is one of the most common tooling units on the assembly machine. It comes equipped with a limited lube slide or the cast iron dovetail slide. 
rectangular pick and place is cam controlled. Vertical motion for the slide comes through the bell crank and the arm. The horizontal comes from the horizontal arm, compliant link, and the rods. Because of the many pivot points involved in the linkage system, a double compliant link is used and a hardened stop to maintain the accuracy. As a horizontal arm strokes forward and the hardened button hits its stop, the unit will comply internally, thereby eliminating the play and providing the accuracy. Here you see the sequence again as we jog the machine. First, the hardened button contacts the stop, and the unit complies. Horizontal stroke adjustment is provided by a slot that's been milled into the arm. To increase the stroke, the T-nut would be lowered. When doing this, an increase in the length of the link is required. Also, if the stroke is decreased by the slot being moved up, the length of the link will also have to be decreased. The horizontal link is double compliance, which means it'll comply both in-stroke and out-stroke. In order to do that, the inside of the unit has a spring and a sleeve arrangement. When pushing, the unit will continue forward, compress the spring going forward. When pulling, the unit will stop and pull against it. After repeated use, the spring becomes compressed. In order to take the play out of the unit, the jam nut would be loosened and the large hex stock turned in, tightened to reestablish the mention where there is no play in the unit. Care must be taken not to over tighten the hex or the play will be reintroduced because you have compressed the spring. Once the play is taken out of the unit, it can be reinstalled. Adjustments to this link need not be made with the unit apart. With it installed on the machine, access has been provided in the front of the unit to get at it with two wrenches. Your adjustment can be made here, tightened, checked for play, and you can be back in business. This is a limited lube pick and place slide. To make your fine adjustments for your height, you loosen the two half inch bolts, twist the link arm accordingly to raise or lower the head to make your adjustments. Once you're satisfied, lock the two nuts up. Check for compensation of the link. You depress the slide upwards, be sure you have free travel and that the unit is not jammed. This is a standard pickup head arrangement. To facilitate movement and alignment of the head, you would loosen the top two screws, loosen the bottom two screws. You have left and right adjustment, you have front and back adjustment. Once your adjustment is set, tighten the two screws on top, tighten your two screws on bottom. The purpose of the rise and fall mechanism is to provide an economical actuation of operations that require simple vertical travel, such as inspection for presence and position, as well as hold down and stripping operations. The rise and fall mechanism consists of extruded aluminum rails that usually run the full length of the machine. These rails are connected to vertical hardened shafts, which in turn are controlled by cams mounted on the lower camshaft. The standard mounting bracket provides a simple attachment for inspection units and hold downs and can be easily repositioned if necessary. This is a standard Bodine inspection unit. It's driven off the rise and fall bar. Shown here is 40 to 60 thousandths compensation because you're sitting on a good part. With the compensation, the LED light will be out. In this condition, the part is set high. I have more than 60 thousandths compensation. The LED light is on, designating a bad part. In this condition, there's no part, there's no compensation. The LED light is on, designating no part. If correct readings are not obtained, the unit can be adjusted by raising or lowering the inspection block. Refer to your manual for more information.
This is a limited lube, heavy duty press. It's a cam operated toggle press rated for six tons max. The upper and the lower units are made identical. The adjustments for the press are made from the slide blocks and the jack screws, which are identical top and bottom. The two units are tied together with tie rods, inner and outer. They box the unit in, making it rigid, keeping it from deflecting. Adjustments are made on the slide blocks by the jack screw and the slide block itself. Adjust the screw up, the slide block goes up, adjust the screw down, the slide block comes down. Both the lower and upper slide blocks are identical. The adjustments are made the same, jack screw and slide block. In order to check to make sure that the press has its maximum stroke, jog the machine in until the press is fully toggled. You need to check the clearance between the back of the pin and the adjustment plate. The screw will be loosened and the adjustment plate slid in behind the pin. If there is no clearance, the unit will have to be adjusted out. If there is too much clearance, the unit will have to be adjusted in. Coming from the other side of the machine to make your adjustments for the maximum stroke, loosen the jam nuts on both ends of the tie rod. Adjust the tie rod until your adjustment plate slides behind the pin in front. Once your adjustment is made, retighten the jam nuts on both ends and double check your front adjustment. After your max stroke has been set, adjustments to the slide block can be made by unlocking the jack screw and the slide block, a downward stroke adjustment, turn the jack screw down, tighten the unit back up, cycle the press through one stroke, See if your adjustment is correct. If not, go through the same procedure. To reference specific part numbers or to get more detailed information on the procedures in this video program, consult your operation and maintenance manual or contact Bodine's service department. We thank you for taking the time to watch this program. We hope that it has been a helpful overview for operating and maintaining the Bodine inline assembly and test machine.